Um, again, thank you, Catherine, for, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us. My name is Jalitha Moore, and I am the Director of Business Engagement and Inclusion for One Sperma Inc. And I have the great pleasure of um, doing a panel discussion with some of our local entrepreneurs. Um, they are shining and, and winning in their uh, respective fields. And I have the pleasure of um, sitting with them today and asking them some questions. I get the chance to be all in their business. Um, so we hope that you've been able to gain the knowledge that you needed today to help move you and your business forward. Um, I'm excited about this portion of the symposium as we gain firsthand insight to what works and what hasn't worked with our local entrepreneurs in this last year. So joining us for this discussion, we have very, uh, five very diverse and experienced business owners. And I'll let them introduce themselves with their name, their business, their years in Spartanburg, and anything else they would like to say. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And let's see who I have first in my window. I have Kenneth Cribb. Oh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Is my mic on? Yes, hey, we can hear you. Thanks. Hey, hope you all had a great program so far. Um, I'm just kind of tuning in right now. But um, yeah, my name is Kenneth Cribb, and I'm one of the founding partners with a restaurant company called Hub City Hospitality. Uh, we have three concepts, uh, Willy Taco, Freight Yard, and Flock Shop. Um, we have five locations in the upstate. Uh, we have 300 employees, about 25 um, management folks, and we're a, we're a growing um, entrepreneurial upstart. Uh, we, we love this community. Um, we, we call Spartanburg home. Um, we are extremely grateful to, to this community. Um, I, I personally have, have been in Spartanburg my whole life, um, with the exception of um, going away to college, um, taking a couple of um, entry level type, um, you know, white collar jobs after, after college. Um, worked in, in, in restaurants all through high school, um, a little bit in, in college. Um, have always loved this industry, um, lo love the, the people component um, and, and so many other facets um, and uh, moved back to Spartanburg um, a little over a decade ago. Um, my brother, William Cribb, is, is one of the finest culinary minds um, in, in the region, in our opinion, and um, kind of decided it a certain point to, to make my life's work, um, trying to champion his amazing food and maybe inject some, some personality and some hospitality into the, the front of the house operations for, for our restaurants. Uh, most recently, um, the last year and a half or so, I've focused predominantly on marketing, uh, communications, PR, and um, uh, community relations for, um, for our company. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Kenneth, for that. Let me see who's next. I see Leslie Cash in the next window. So Leslie, if you'll introduce yourself. Yeah, so hopefully everybody can hear me too, I hope. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Leslie Cash. Um, so I have a very different story. Um, my family's been in this business for 50 to 60 years. I had a completely different career path. I, I'm one of the owners and the uh, managers and operators of the Country Meat Center in Woodruff, South Carolina. Um, I was a teacher, a school counselor, totally different path. I actually went to college with Kenneth. Um, I got to Charleston. We graduated the same year. Um, so, you know, I had a completely different path. And my grandfather and my father came to me about four or five years ago and said, you know, we've been doing this a long time, but we want to bring on you. We want to do something new. We want to do it together and bigger and better. And so that's what we've done. Um, we've built this nice, beautiful, big business. We've been able to expand already. Um, we actually just finished a little minor second expansion. So we're super excited and everything we're doing, we're doing it as a family, um, but we're also like, like the Cribs are doing it as a family. And, um, you know, it's just, it's fun every day. I love it. I'm on mute. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Leslie. Um, let me see who else I see in the corner. I see Ms. Pompiola. Would you love to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business? Sure. I'm Pompiola Mac Abernathy, one of the owners of Cleedale Historic Inn and Gardens right here on the west side of Spartanburg. Um, this turned out, this was a dream of mine long time ago. So um, this is a chance for me to realize my dream. Um, have been here in Spartanburg since uh, 2012. Um, took about a year and a half to renovate the property. And uh, it seems to be going well, I must say. Very well, going very well. Thank you so much for that. And next, I'll call on Miss Karen Knuckles. Hello. Okay, hello, how are you? Wonderful. Good, I've been having some technical difficulties this afternoon. Are you able to see and hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can, yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, awesome. All right, my name is Karen Knuckles and my husband and I are the owners of Express Employment Professionals in Spartanburg. Um, we provide light industrial, administrative, and professional employment opportunities. Uh, our company is ISO certified. We have the pleasure of being awarded the best in staffing talent and best in staffing client in 2021 by Clearly Rated. Um, our office opened in 2007. Um, we were blessed to survive the recession, and now we can also say we successfully survived the pandemic. <laughs> I am an active and invested member of the Spartanburg community, and I currently serve on the boards of One Spartanburg, Inc. and the Mary Black Foundation. We are originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and now very fondly call Spartanburg home. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all for those wonderful introductions. Um, we do have one member of the panel that is trying to get logged on right now. So um, what we'll do is once he gets logged in, I think he's having some technical difficulties. I think this, this rain and the storm has kind of got everybody a little jumbled up with technology. So we'll give him an opportunity to get logged in and introduce himself a little later. But I want to go ahead and get to the nitty gritty. I want to ask some questions um, of our local entrepreneurs and our business owners. I want to get all in your business. It's nothing um, um, negative or anything like that, but I do want you to share your experience with our business owners and tell about the successes and the challenges and the things that you've seen um, as far as, as being a business owner, being an entrepreneur, um, especially during this last year and things that we've all had to endure as far as the pandemic. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my first question. And we can do this round robin. Um, so I'll ask this of Kenneth first, since you are first on my screen. Why did you decide to start your business? Well, um, we were in the early stages of Cribs Kitchen, um, the most recent Cribs Kitchen um, downtown next to RJ Rockers when um, we were noticed by um, a really successful uh, restaurateur, entrepreneur, um, a gentleman by the name of Bill Burton. Um, and gradually we formed a team comprised of Bill and my brother William and myself, um, a gentleman named Eric Holman, who was um, uh, an executive at, at Fats Cafe, um, and a gentleman uh, named Richard Heatley. And the five of us wanted to come together and just do something that we felt was um, going to be appreciated in, in this market. Um, we, uh, our, our original idea evolved over time. At first, we thought we wanted to do kind of an elevated um, Tex-Mex type, type res uh, restaurant. Um, we traveled a lot together as a, as a team and, and, and learned a, a great deal regionally. Um, eventually, our concept evolved into more of a tacos and tequila kind of concept that's really fun and, and high energy um, and colorful with awesome flavors and fantastic people um, with a reasonable price point um, and uh, just very fresh 
cuisine. Um, so that's that's how it how it kind of came together. We we worked together um, just in the formative stages for over a year um, conceptually and, and to include construction and all of that at 930 East Main Street. Um, but um, you know the beauty was really the the, the balance of, of ideas and, and the balance of um, experience levels of age. Um, I was in my late twenties at the time, um, and so so were Richard and, and William, uh, Bill and Eric were more like our fathers' ages and had 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 quite a bit of success. And we we were pretty confident in our abilities fundamentally as it pertained to to food and service, but frankly, we were, we were young and um, it was an amazing opportunity to learn about the business side of, of the restaurant business. So we had built-in mentors um, who were uh, prudent and, um, and, and experienced. And, you know, we were young and brash and wanted to, you know, get it done yesterday and, and fly by the seat of our pants. And, um, and it takes a little bit of both um, to, to, to make it work. And um, so uh, we, we knew we wanted to do something here in Spartanburg, um, first and foremost. And um, eventually our brands kind of in, in some ways became more, more of, of upstate South Carolina brands. But um, we make no mistake about our origins and, and our love of, of Spartanburg. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, let me see, um, Karen. Why did you to start um, decide to start your own business? Okay. You know what? Um, you know, during my career, um, I had the pleasure of learning from some outstanding leaders, and having some positions that really allowed me to stretch and grow and to climb that corporate ladder. Right? That that was everybody's dream. Well, it wasn't quite mine. You know, I got that entrepreneurial itch and had it for quite some time, but knew that we needed to, we being my husband and I needed to wait until a certain point in our personal and financial life uh, that we could really take that leap of faith. You know, honestly, I just wanted the chance to influence my own destiny and more importantly, to be able to do something that I was passionate about. And uh, when I graduated high school, and I know that's going back a long, long way, but I promise I'll keep this short. Uh, my family couldn't afford for me to go to college, and so I knew I'd have to go to college and work at the same time. And I'll tell you, I applied to a million places to get a job when I graduated high school. Um, and I had so many no's, I was disheartened. I finally went to one employment agency that took the time to give me feedback and some really tough love about why I did not get the job. The next day, though, to my surprise, they called and invited me back. And I took their feedback seriously, and I showed up very differently than I did that first time. They offered me a position on the spot working inside of their office. And I remember the impact that had on me and how much they helped me start my career. Those folks have been mentors of mine ever since. And for me to watch the pleasure that I see and the excitement in my team members' eyes, because we get to do that same thing time and time again as we help people and companies in our community. So to be able to work at something that you love is the reason why I decided to start this particular business. That is beautiful. I keep hearing the word passion and, and, and this is something that you love and something that you want to do. Um, and I, I know that that in order to start a business, it has to be something that you really, really, really want to do and something that you believe in. So thank you for sharing that. Um, let's move to Leslie. Um, I know that it's a, a family history and behind your business, but tell me why you want to go into the family business. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a lot of different reasons. One, um, of course, I wanted to join the venture with my family. Um, but two, you know, I love people. And so I knew that what I could bring 
could be something very different than my family, but also something special. And I think together, I just knew together, all these different skills, it would just work well. I mean, you know, you got my grandfather who's literally had a business doing this since the fifties and sixties. He started in this little tiny shack of a, of a place with like the floors had sawdust on them. And this was like the old school, you know, um, butcher shop. And then my dad, who kind of moved downtown and we had, um, we had Brown's Grocery and then we had the downtown um, curbside market and it kind of grew, you know, a little bit and a little bit. And then they have all this experience, but then I have this completely different, you know, view with social media and marketing and PR, you know, all that that I could bring. And I knew that together it would just be magical. And so far it really has been, you know, you just, you didn't know, I just didn't know it was going to be this great, I guess I should say, but um, it's worked out really, really well. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And let's go to Miss Pontiola. Why did you start your business, this beautiful bed and breakfast? It started out as a dream of mine in college. Keep your own mute. Am I? No. I I think you can hear. Uh oh, she's unmuted. She's muted now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could hear her before. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, gotcha. okay good. <laughs> um, I think it first started when I was a child, and my grandmother and grand my grandmother and my mother um, cooked every Sunday, and I always wondered why did they cook so much food. Um, but they cook so that any and everyone who wanted to stop by after church could and could have a decent meal. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to when I went to college, um, I was singing with a mixed pop ensemble called Carolina Alive. And we were the ambassadors for the president of the college at the time. And every time we traveled, even when we traveled abroad, we stayed in people's homes. And it was there that the idea of owning a bed and breakfast started. Um, and so after retiring from radio, I decided, okay, this is my chance. Um, my husband and I were in uh, Washington DC for about 27 years living on Capitol Hill. I was ready to come back South. Um, where people were not so much um, high anxiety about government <laughs> and all of that. And so we came back south, started this business, and I have not looked back, not once. Wonderful. That was a beautiful story. I did not know the ins and outs of why you started the bed and breakfast. So that is beautiful. And thank you for coming back to the South. We we love you here in Spartanburg. Um, I do want to bring in, we do have our um, other panelists here with us. He was able to log in. Um, if we can bring in Mr. Terrence Dawkins with the ballet. And we'll yes, let good him, afternoon. How are we'll you? Let, wonderful. How are you? <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I'm doing great. And I'm actually about to pull up at the office so i am zooming and driving which is okay. not safe. Uh, hence while i don't have my video on okay so what we what we can do is we will hold off on and we want you to get there safely so when you get there safely you just let us know and we will um get you back on and get Absolutely. you caught up so what we'll do now on to another question for our panelists um let me ask you this um, and this can be for anyone on the panel. Once COVID hit, how soon did you know you needed to transition something or pivot to be successful? And what did you do to get that to that transition or pivot to something successful? And I'll ask that again. Once COVID hit, how soon did you know you needed to transition to something or pivot to be successful? And what did you do? I don't mind going first. Um, Go ahead. I can tell you it was immediate um, for us. It was actually amazing how 
So it was like on the news at 12 o'clock and then literally this large mass of people came in and just started grabbing meat. Like it was, you know, we didn't even know what was going on because we hadn't been watching the news. You know, we're just sitting there kind of like, what's happening? And then all of a sudden it was like, it just hit. And it got to where they were just cleaning us out. There was a line out the door and we were just wrapping and going as fast as we possibly could. And to the point we had a line and I would have to, you know, do limits and say, you know, I need one package for this person, one package for this family. And it was just so immediate. Um, and that was the day we knew, I mean, right then that second, we're like, okay, everything has changed from this moment on. And we knew that. And so we had to immediately implement, we had to make sure we did a few different things. One thing that I think is really important, um, especially as a small business person that we've learned through this is having multiple, multiple vendors, not depending on just one, you know, one or two people, um, because it can get you stuck. And that was one thing that we luckily had many, many vendors that we use that we depend on, not just one. So when COVID hit and everybody was grabbing up the chicken and grabbing up the, you know, all these things, we were able to say, okay, you know what, let's just rearrange. Let's call this person and this person. We were able to get it in and get it stopped really, really quickly. So I think that's one thing is definitely having multiple vendors. But then of course, two, um, the next thing was safety. So automatically you had to go to, okay, we need masks. We've got to do the spacing on the floors. We've got to do hand sanitizers. We got to do wiping the carts. We had to do the plexiglass in front of all of our cashiers. You know, you start thinking about, okay, safety for customers, safety for your employees, because of course we're responsible for them. Um, and we've got around 30 to 35. So, um, you know, your mind goes to a million places, but those were the, the immediate, immediate things. And we, in our business, saw it instantly. So I don't know about other fields, but definitely in the grocery business we did. Definitely. And I want to explore the different um, industries like Ms. Pompiola, I know that you're in the hosp hospitality industry. How did COVID affect you and what did you do to transition? Um, for us, it also happened almost immediately. Um, we were just coming out of the tornado when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And so we went from trying to uh, revamp our gardens to the first shutdown and coming up with COVID protocols. So then we first did um, a COVID um, self-declaration form that everybody, we would send it out electronically and that every one of our guests had to complete. We made sure we had masks available. We started taking temperatures um, and we still do that even though many people have been vaccinated. Um, one of the things that I did was I started, um, I started out not only developing those protocols and everything, but I also decided that I would join an online bed and breakfast group. Um, and this group comprised of bed and breakfast owners from all across the nation, um, as well as abroad. And so as a result of talking with them, seeing some of the things they had to do, um, uh, developing the protocols were easy because some you're sharing information with everybody and so it's very easy to take on some of the ideas that they have shared with you. Um, we updated our website in order to um, add those COVID protocols to them. Um, we became more interactive um, because I started doing online videos. Um, and then we further developed our brand by, um, we came up with a new logo. We started putting that on all our pictures and everything. Um, and then we started collaborating with other businesses such that if you came to stay because people were afraid to go to restaurants at the time, then we would have a personal chef come in and do a dinner for the guests. So 
you just, <laughs> you reevaluate and you do whatever is necessary to keep people calm and to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'll shoot over to Kenneth. Uh, being in the restaurant industry, how did you um, pivot or how did you transition with all of the restaurants that you have to juggle? How did you guys do? Or what did you yeah. guys do? Yeah, it's, it's a really great story, and, um, and much of it is, is ongoing um, today, but we were, we were throwing the uh, 2020 St. Patrick's Day party at, at Freight Yard, kind of right as this thing was emerging in the, in the public conscience, and, um, you know, it was, it was brand new. We knew it was real. Um, we decided to go ahead and kind of have that be our, our last hurrah before, um, and, and then to, to, to just watch and, and, and listen and learn. Um, so we were actually at a, a business retreat at Katichi in the Lake Hartwell area. Um, the, the six of us that are business partners together, um, when the governor came on and, 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 and announced some, some major findings about what was going on, we're watching the news and um, it was kind of like, you know, Rome was burning and we felt guilty about, about being an hour and a half away, but um, knew there was nothing that we could immediately do um, right there and then. This was, um, this was on, a, on a Sunday evening, I believe, or, or perhaps Monday. Um, but we immediately uh, got to work and we'll say that we've just been extremely disciplined from day one as far as um, our resources, as far as putting every shred of profitability back into the operating account. As far, we had a strong cash position heading into it, um, but we also had um, the, the leadership and the vision of, of, of Bill, Bill Burton, um, whereas naturally we were um, in, a, in a position to, to, to panic, um, he, he said to us at the table, hey guys, listen, this is gonna be really challenging. This is gonna be very, very hard. Um, we don't know what to expect, but we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it out on top. We're going to emerge from this thing stronger than, um, than, than, than where we were uh, before. Um, this is why we've been so disciplined because we, you just never know what's, what, what's up ahead of you. And um, we immediately began communicating with all of our employees and, and with the management teams. Um, as soon as it became um, a, you know, a timely um, initiative, we began the process of identifying those people that you know, wanted to stay on and, and work through this on a daily basis and, and those that um, would be more um, inclined to go on unemployment. And um, we're, you're talking about young people um, with you know, little, little experience um, navigating through these things. So we kind of held their hands and, and walked them through um, the process of getting um, on unemployment. Um, we do have, I'm happy to report, a, a really amazing caliber of people working with us. So, you know, we don't really have today a, a ton of people um, intentionally sitting on the, on the sidelines collecting a check as opposed to, to, to working with us because we've created a great culture along the way. Um, but one of, the, one of the technical things that we immediately began to work on was a carryout program. We had never done carryout before, except for flock shop, which is our hot chicken concept. Um, we felt that the, the real experience at Willie Taco um, was the one that you had um, at, you know, in our cantina or at, at our table side. Um, and uh, that our food didn't necessarily travel very well. And that was our, and it was controversial at times, but that was our position for um, seven years. Um, we immediately uh, reassessed that and implemented a, a company-wide um, carryout program that for um, a solid uh, six weeks, um, that's my estimation, um, was our only revenue. And it was scary. Um, and uh, our Crews were skeleton crews, and um, you know there were a lot of things we had to do to to, to raise the morale. Um, we did a gift card sales initiative where, for a solid week, every um, every dollar uh, sold 
um, in the form of gift cards went back to our employees and we raised $20,000 um and over the span of a week um which um at the time we had about 250 employees and if you think about it um twenty thousand dollars doesn't go very far uh but it was at least uh, a cell phone bill or um, a couple of grocery bills or some, something like that and you know most importantly we just made it known that um we were we were listening and we were there and um, we weren't going anywhere and that we would get through this um, as a team. Obviously, we had to follow a bunch of CDC guidelines that we still follow today. And there are a lot of things like signage, um, like Leslie was um, referring to, and certain um, things that had to be done physically in the, in the, in the, in the locations. But gradually, things started coming back to, um, back to life in the form of outside dining and then 50% dining room capacities and, and now full capacity. Um, we, we are um, still wearing masks and abiding by the CDC guidelines and we want people to feel um, safe um, and uh, we wanna be responsible. Um, but uh, it, there, was a, there, there were a whole myriad of, of, of responsibilities and obstacles that we had to, to climb over to get through this thing. But I'm very happy to report that um, when, it, when looking at uh, 2020, uh, our, our company is up 200%. Um, and we are um, in lockstep, if not on average, um, five to eight percent above um, 2019 numbers. Um, we also opened two new restaurants um, in the middle of a pandemic year. So, um, you know, uh, we, we've, we've been ironclad and, you know, we're weathering the storm and we know we're not out of the woods yet, but um, we, we feel good about where we are today. Wow. Wow. Um... That just, um, I, I love that because it speaks to the heart of this community, especially with the gift cards in, in your employees. It definitely speaks to the hardest partners and how uh, we try to support and want to support our small businesses. I'm going to kick it over to Ms. Karen Knuckles. How have you transitioned or how have you had to pivot during COVID-19? So we, like some of the other uh, presenters, we felt the impact immediately. You know, our, our client companies were calling in to say, hey, I think I need to cancel these orders. I need to reduce my staff. And oh, by the way, you know, we're trying to figure out how we're going to make it through this. Any pointers you can share with us? Uh, we had our associates who were, you know, canceling interviews. They were declining positions. Uh, and in the face of all that, also had my internal team, you know, thinking, OK, what's next? And so having to deal with the level of anxiety that they were feeling about this uncertainty. And so, you know, one of the beauties of having a team and a diverse team that have, you know, various levels of expertise, and that is drawing upon that team to say, okay, team, let's get together. Let's figure out together how we pivot now and what we need to do to support each other, to support our clients, and to support you know, the associates that are coming in looking to us for employment. And so I will tell you, without some of the things that my team brought to bear in terms of ideas about what we can do to help us continue to service our clients, I don't know what I would have done without that team support and then being willing to come forward and, and uh, provide suggestions uh, for Tony and I, you know, we certainly wanted to make sure we were taking care of that team because, you know, that's the team that takes care of the clients and the associates. So we wanted to make sure first and foremost that they felt safe here in the office. Um, we um, had them all work remotely, so we had to pretty quickly implement some technology to allow that to happen. Um, you know, they were called, you know, people were calling here, but it was seamless to them that my team was not in the office because um, we also uh, were able to uh, create a process where we were able to start and finish our in interview process virtually. And so, you know, that was a big help because, again, we had associates who were um, not wanting to come out to complete the interview process, but said, hey, I'd be ready to go to work, but I don't know about, you know, coming out three, four times to start this interview process. So we were able to streamline our process and get everything done virtually. Um, and that helped us in a very significant way. 
We changed our digital presence to have much more of a focus on social media. Um, we used Zoom before it was even in vogue. Um, and that was thanks to, again, having a young team member who was in college at the time to say, hey, here's how I do my classes. Let's see if we can't do that. So I tell you what, uh, a team that has the same passion um, is most important. And they've, they've helped us a great deal through this. And, you know, like some of the other presenters, you know, there were times when, you know, we were wondering, okay, are we going to survive this or not? But, you know, we stand here today saying, you know what, we are thankful that, you know, we've had uh, diverse clients who are all impacted in different ways. And so also trying to get to know them about how they're impacting so we can help. But, you know, to this day, we are in a much better position right now than we were in 2019 at this time. So. Wonderful. I think that we have um, all discovered the wonderfulness of Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams and all of these other virtual mm -hmm. platforms that we've had to use just to do business. Um, so I definitely understand how everyone had to pivot and the, the younger people had to listen. I I was struggling with Zoom too. I was just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, you know, so thankful for uh, to those that uh, were able to show a lot of us the way um, when it comes to Zoom. I'm going to bring in Mr. Terrence Dawkins with the valet. Um, bring him in and let him introduce like himself. And uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Terrence, and then you can answer this question as well. So um, go ahead and introduce yourself, and then I'll ask you the question that I've asked the rest of the panel. So Great. you give us your name, your business, and how long you've been in Spartanburg and why you do what you do. Sounds good. My name is Terrence Dawkins. I am a native of Spartanburg, born and raised here. Uh, we've been in business since 2012. Um, I forgot the other pieces that I'm supposed to share. I would say the reasons for starting the business, um, being from Spartanburg, being a Southern gentleman, um, hospitality just kind of comes second nature to myself and my business partners. So um we valeted in high school, so it's kind of a no-brainer post-college. Um, it was just an easy business venture for us to start, um, low overhead, but something that could immediately have an impact in Spartanburg. Um, and on a larger scale than what we did in high school, more on a commercial scale, working with businesses and um, things of that nature. But um, I would say just hospitality and just being from Spartanburg was kind of the catalyst for us to actually take the valet to another step post-college. Gotcha. So let me ask you this, Terrence. Um, once COVID hit, how soon did you know you needed to, to transition to something or pivot to be successful? And what did you do? What did the valet do to pivot? Okay. Um, I kind of share the same sentiments, I would say immediately, um, given that a lot of our clientele are restaurants um, and we also service some medical facilities. So literally, I want to say like March 17th is the date that's in my head. I could be off. But um, the peddler, you know, closed down. Restaurants started kind of figure out what they were going to do. And waiting rooms sized down in terms of how many people could actually wait with the patients. So uh, we definitely saw some changes immediately. We just kind of reverted back to just listening to our clients, um, to be completely honest, to seeing what the need was, um, and just seeing how we could best serve them. And I would say to just being prepared for when the restaurants did reopen or when Ms. Fontiola does need our services, um, it just helped to be ready for when our clients do get back up and running. So that's, that's kind of been our, our plan of action in dealing with COVID. Wonderful, thank you for that. No so I, I'm gonna ask a, a question um, and I'm gonna open up the floor for it. And I think that some of you have already hit on it, but I just wanna know, like you could have opened your business anywhere in this world. You could have um, went to some of our sister cities. You could have went to a different state. You could have started, um, you know, across this country. So why Spartanburg? Why our beloved Spartanburg? And we'll start with, let's say Kenneth. Let's start with Kenneth. 
Well, we were already living and, and working in Spartanburg to begin with as um, as 20 somethings. And, um, you know, we're finding, you know, a little bit of early success and um, had already just really found some some very nice um, embracement by the community and, and, and you know, dished it right right back out. To, to all those folks um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and we're just feeling the, the warm and fuzzies. Um, I, frankly, I, I never knew that I would end up returning to Spartanburg and, and being an entrepreneur in Spartanburg. Um, but I think to myself all the time how happy I am that that's where my path um, let, led me and um, just marvel all the time that. What a what a wonderful, um, diverse, talented, um, eclectic uh, community that we have of of, of individuals, and um, have have just really loved watching the the trajectory of of, of this um, city over the last decade. And um, even though we are branching out in, into this, some other markets again. Um, you know, Spartanburg is our is our is our home, and um, we're, we're we're proud to, to to call it that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and Miss Pompeo, I know you hit on a little bit about moving back from DC, but give me a little more about why Spartanburg, why you wanted to um, start your business here in Spartanburg and, and plant roots here again. I am a Southerner. Uh, from a little town called Bishopville, South Carolina, near Columbia. And um, I definitely wanted to come back south uh, once my stint in D.C. was over. Um, when I was um, working, my first job was for National Public Radio's affiliate in Columbia, South Carolina. And I, as a news reporter, covered the upstate. So therefore Spartanburg and Greenville were part of my beat. Um, and I had a love for the area even then. So once you fast forward to spending 27 years in DC and deciding to retire, I definitely wanted to come back South. Also because my mother still lived in Bishopville. And so therefore the South was a no brainer for me. Spartanburg and the upstate is much more progressive. So that was a major reason for us. Um, I actually saw the growth potential, not only for my business here, but also me personally. And so that's the reason I chose Spartanburg. Good stuff, good stuff. Thank you for that. Uh, Miss Karen, why Spartanburg? Well, you know, I happened upon Spartanburg. Um, I was in Charlotte interviewing for a position there and came to Spartanburg for a visit because it was very close to, uh, Spartanburg was the community where my husband's father grew up. I had never been here um, and he wanted me to come to see where his father grew up, had a few family members still here um, and we had some good friends who had just moved to Greenville. So we came down to explore and uh, after that, we left uh, for probably a two week vacation, which we had never taken a vacation that long, allowed us to do a little soul searching. And I said, you know what, instead of that job that I'm interviewing for, I would love to start a business. And you know what, Spartanburg felt pretty good. So uh, came back, did some other exploratory visits. And, you know, and this is a shameless plug for one Spartanburg, but it's the honest to God's truth. <laughs> On one of those visits, I came back, I came down to what was at that time, the chamber. And one of the team members convinced me that there is no other place on earth that is better than Spartanburg. Um, and committed that if you start that entrepreneurial journey here, I'll, I'll walk beside you, I'll help you, we'll do whatever we can to support you. And the kind of welcome I got there was very different than some of the other places that I was considering. So that really had a lot to do with it. Uh, also, in terms of looking at the economic growth, and more importantly, the potential 
for additional economic growth. That was certainly something very attractive to me. And if I was in real estate, I would say location, 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 um, because where else could I be when it would only take me a few minutes to get to work without a lot of traffic? More importantly, I could get to the beach in just a few hours. I could get to the mountains in an hour. And if I had the itch for the big city again, I could get to one of those within an hour or two as well. So Spumberg made me feel like this could be home for me and my family. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And I'm actually going to transition into um, some more questions and I'll kick this one off to Leslie. Um, Leslie, let me ask you this. What's the best advice you give to other entrepreneurs in an existing business or trying to navigate these circumstances? Um, and um, would you give, what, what advice would you give to any new entrepreneurs wanting to start in your particular field? Sure. Um, there's, I have learned so many things from the beginning of this till now. I mean, I just can't even, there's so much wisdom I could probably give, but um, my, I have to say my grandfather likes to give me wisdom all the time. So I will share some of the things he has shared with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, some of the important things he has said from the beginning, and this is for grocery in particular retail. If you don't have it, you can't sell it. And that's one of the most important things. So you make sure that you have multiple vendors. You make sure that you have the stock. You make sure that you're being creative, thinking outside the box, not just, you know, what you want, but you got to make sure you're thinking about your community and how to best serve it and its needs. Um, I really love local. So one of the things that I do in our store is I have local sections and I, in particular, pull from local vendors, um, like the Great Eight out of um, Simpsonville, um, Blue Moon Specialty Foods in Spartanburg, um, you know, lots of different, the Perones. I try to get some different vendors that are local because I really want to support them. A lot of local farms, um, we do our produce a lot is from like Stewart Farms, Strawberry Hill, places that are here. Um, I think it's really, really important that we support each other that we support local. Um, so that's one thing that we really, I think is really important. Um, I think being present is really important. Um, you can't, um, I remember I had an employee who she, she just started working with us about a month ago and she was like, you guys are like always here. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> we are. And she was like, my last fall, she was like, he was never there. And I was like, well, yeah, it's really important. I said, because you're not just selling your stuff. <laughs> I was like, you're selling you too, you know, you're a brand. And so it's really important that people see you and they know you and they connect with you. Um, so I think that's really important being present um, for your employees, for the community. And then of course we talked about passion. Gotta have the passion always. Um, and, and I think also being grateful. I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned too, is even in the really hard times, really in the hard days, is being grateful that we would have this experience, that we are able to do what we do. Um, and we get to meet the people we get to meet. We get to know each other. You know, it's just a really cool experience every day. And I think if we're not grateful for it, you know, it can slip through our fingers. So we gotta be grateful for every person, every employee, and every opportunity that we get. Wow, um, those were those were great words to listen to our um, our existing entrepreneurs and anyone that's looking to start a new business as well. So thank you for that, Leslie. I'm actually gonna kick that question also to Terrence Dawkins. Terrence, what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs wanting to start a business? All right. Um, off the top, I would say first, maybe identify a need. Um, definitely, once you find a need or find a void, uh, if you believe in it or if your past aligns with that, that'll definitely help as far as just the entry into the market um, because we all need help. So whenever someone creates a value service or 
a product that'll make your life that much easier. Um, that's just a great starting point. Then two, I would just say definitely build relationships. Um, here in Spartanburg and pretty much anywhere, so much of business is just who you know and how you treat people. So definitely build relationships and uh, just get better every day. Um, every day is just an opportunity for your business to get better and for you to work on yourself personally and you will eventually see the compound effect and you know those days will add up and you will be quote unquote successful <laughs> <laughs> and happy and happy that's, that's important and happy exactly um i actually i wanna i love this question so i'm gonna kick it off to some more um panelists as well miss karen what what advice would you give to a new entrepreneur or someone that's trying to start in this business as well you know, I've, I've learned so much since I started this business and uh, a lot of the advice has been shared with me. I'm happy to share. And, and a few things that I would say is one, I think it's important that you know your business inside and out. Um, I think it's important to have a strong business support system that's financial, legal, marketing, um, but also to have a broad network because there's so many times when, you know, my network is who came to the rescue and to help me and to give me ideas and have a diverse business mix. Stay close to your clients in good times and in bad and know that all business is not good business. And at the end of the day, have a servant's heart and be humble, right? That servant's heart is not just for your team, your clients and your associates, but for your community because the work that I do impacts a lot of people in this community. And so my servant's heart says, if there's opportunities for me to give back and to serve in capacities that could help this community to make sure I'm able to carve out a little time to do that. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna, I, I love this question and I love the answers. Ms. Pontiola, can you give us some advice or give some advice to new entrepreneurs or someone trying to start out in this business? I have a, only a few because almost everyone has spoken of some of the ones that I would have said. So first communicate, talk as much as possible with other business owners, people in the community, your neighbors. There is nothing like the sharing of information collaborate, discuss ideas, working together to boost each other. Um, I will never forget when I first moved here to Spartanburg in 2012, one of the things that I wanted to do was to make sure that I knew every business owner or I knew the people who worked in the restaurant or because I love to drink, I wanted to know every bartender. Um, and so I did that every week while um, the renovations were going on. I thought this is my opportunity to get to know everyone. So I did that. The other thing is create, put your creative mind to work. Think outside the box. Um, expand your business offerings as much as possible. And you might even want to do that when there is no more COVID every year, evaluate and add something. Um, and then uh, let's see, what else would I say? Stay the course. Uh, prayer is very important to me as that has always been a part of my life. And so if it's not, um, maybe meditating or whatever um, you might do in order to enhance your creativity and something that feeds you, do it. Y'all are really dropping some gems here. Um, Kenneth, I'm gonna bring you in and, and, and tell me what you would say to someone that's, that's trying to start a business or someone that's um, already starting a business and just needs some advice on how to get started. Sure. Um, and just love what the other panelists have had to say um, to this point. We'll try not to um, be redundant here. Uh, but, you know, um, the neat thing about the, the restaurant business is that um, there are so many transferable 
um, I, ideals and, 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 and practices and, uh, and principles. Um, and when I say that, um, you know, the, the restaurant business is, is, is comparable fun, fundamentally to, to, to other businesses. And then skill sets from, from other um, areas um, of, 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 of work or education um, other fields um, tra transfer so nicely in, into the restaurant business. So when you when you're when you're speaking about um, the restaurant business, you're speaking about business. Um, but everyone wants to be in the restaurant business, and um, you know maybe you're known for throwing the the best dinner party in town. Um, well, you know uh, it's a tough business, and uh, the national average of profitability in the restaurant business is around eight percent. Um, those are pretty, pretty thin margins. And the, uh, the turnover, the annual turnover percentage in the restaurant business is over 70%. So that means that over the course of a year of the hundred people you're working with, um, maybe, maybe 30 or so will still be there at the end of the year. Um, it's a really tricky industry. And so that's why, and think about how many amazing chefs, um, how many uh, amazingly hospitable uh, people have started a, a mom and pop restaurant and and they've shuttered after a year uh, before a year. Um, you know, we, we, we can sit here and think of, of, of half a dozen that we've known and loved um, over the past few years. Um, well, that's where um, business acumen really does come into the fold. So, you know, having a having a pro forma, um, having sets of projections uh, one, three, five years, um, putting together a professional profit and loss statement um, that you study, you know, knowing every single uh, cent that is coming in your business and going out of your, your, your business, um, doing market analytics when it comes to uh, the location that you, that you choose. And if you're leasing, then um, getting a, a favorable lease um, that um, is not um, prohibitive and uh, where, where overhead is not a, a tremendous piece of your pie. Um, and then, you know, obviously, um, you know, you've got to have a good, a good product. And um, I love what Karen said about having um, the heart of a servant and um, what so many folks have said about, uh, about community and, and, and just uh, vision and passion. And I'll just share this with you. One of the neat things that we've been up to um, now that we're almost 10, 10 years um, into this restaurant company that, that I have the pleasure of being involved in is we're, we're, when we were at Katichi uh, before COVID hit, we were actually um, having kind of a summit where we were discussing these foundational documents that we've been working on for um, over five years now. And one of the neat things that we've, um, that we've put together is our vision statement. Um, and uh, we parsed every word um, very, very deliberately, but our vision statement is uh, together we can positively impact the lives of all we touch. Um, and it's very, it's very powerful and it's very, um, you know, the folks that come and work with us, um, they, they drink that Kool-Aid and um, we, we live it and we breathe it and it's, that's the stuff um, of, of that, that, that grows, that grows a culture and it starts as a top down kind of phenomenon. And then it becomes more of a grassroots bo bottom up kind of phenomenon. Um, after you sow those seeds and, um, we hold ourselves accountable, um, to, to our people, um, not, not the other way around. And we, we believe in servant leadership and, um, you know, certain, certain principles like, like those, um, are, are very important. Wow. Thank Julie, you. Thank but you. Can I add something? Um, Absolutely. That Absolutely. I just thought of. Um, if there are any young entrepreneurs out there, I believe that now is a perfect time for doing it because there's so much assistance out there financially, as well as um, uh, advice and help with doing business plans and all of that. And so I just want to add that. Absolutely. There are uh, a ton of resources out here to um, help anyone that wants to start 
a business or if you're in it already in, have a business and, and need some assistance as well there are a ton of resources out um, here to assist you with that um i'm actually going to see do we have any questions from uh, my audience or do we have anyone that wants to unmute and ask a question of our panelists um, I do see in the comments that um, um, so Anita said, I'm really enjoying and appreciate all of your stories and your passion for Spark Merch. And she would love to connect and perhaps collaborate with some of you. So that's great. This is what, what it's all about is collaboration. Spark Merch has a great collaborative spirit. So absolutely, Anita. Um, so people would love to collaborate with you. Let's see any questions. Um, so if, if I don't see any questions, do, um, do we have anybody that just wants to wrap up and say one more thing? And, and, and we're going to try to be good stewards of everyone's time and, and end on time. But do we have anyone that just wants to wrap up and, and say one thing? Kenneth or Miss Pompiola, Karen, Karen, so Leslie, anything in regards to entrepreneurship and and just one last hurrah for those that are, are in business or those that are looking to start a business. Um, sure. Uh, I'll just say that most businesses are the, are the people business. Incidentally, we're in the, in the business of, of serving hopefully a really great dining experience with, with good food and beverage and, and wonderful um, service. But um, at the end of the day, uh, most businesses are the, the people business and um, the, the notion of team building, um, of, of, of creating a, a culture, um, of surrounding yourselves with people that are more talented than you uh, deliberately and not trying to take everything on yourself, um, dividing and conquering and, um, you know, uh, thought, thoughtful delegation. Um, you know, those things. And, you know, we, uh, we, we just love that uh, in, in the restaurant business, um, you know, just in Spartanburg alone, um, this time of the year, we see about 10,000 people a, a week um, walking through our doors. And it's a very, it's a very public um, vocation, uh, f full of, full of relationships. And um, that's one of the things that we absolutely love about it because we, we see our friends walking through our doors every single day and we see them out in the community at the grocery store, the hardware store, or at, at other restaurants or, or public events. And um, if you can find a way to, to be in a line of work um, su such as that, then, then you're, you're, you're truly, truly blessed. And um, we're, we're just very, very grateful um, for, for this, this community that we're able to, to live and, 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 and operate within. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Do we have um, anyone else that wanted to give one last final word? Um, and if not, then um, I want to say a huge thank you. Thank you to Kenneth, uh, Ms. Pontiola, Karen, Terrence, and Leslie. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your words of encouragement for our small business community and those that are looking to become entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for everything that you shared on this call today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for our first small business symposium. Um, we have been working tirelessly during this past year to assist small businesses with the resources they need to succeed during these, these challenges. Many can be found on our Bring Back the Bird website um, and it is up for you there. And if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to me, um, as well as you can find our resources on our onesfarmbirdinc.com website as well. Right now, there is a Remember Your Favorites campaign to help local restaurants and even more to come. As you may have, as you have questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. You can contact myself um, or John Turner, John Kimbrell or Alan Smith or anyone on our team at One Spartanburg Inc. Um, again, we appreciate you joining us and hope you have found today's topics beneficial. As we continue to support small businesses, we look forward to the bright future ahead. Have a great week and thank you again.